Greta Garbo was swept from an impoverished childhood in icy Stockholm to become the most famous face on planet Earth by the late 1920s. This was a fairy tale story, but Garbo was not enchanted by it. She was the greatest mystery Hollywood ever produced, especially after she quit the screen forever at just 36, retreating to live the life of a recluse in a sumptuous New York apartment. Garbo was so enigmatic she was nicknamed the Sphinx, but what was the dark and somber cloud that hung over her, the most desired and admired woman in the world? Her wildly passionate affairs with men and women, her secretive and dangerous actions during World War II, and the constant weight of the many tragedies that afflicted her are all possible reasons that she turned her back on Hollywood. This is the thrilling, deeply mysterious life of Greta Garbo, the woman who turned her back on it all and simply asked to be left alone. Welcome to Hollywood Mysteries. In Södermalm, Stockholm, Sweden, there stands a monument on the building where Greta Garbo was born. Known originally as Greta Lovisa Gustafsson, she came into the world on September 18, 1905. She was the youngest of three children born to Carl Alfred Gustafsson, a laborer, and Anna Lovisa, a housewife who also worked as a laborer in a jam factory. Her siblings were Sven Alfred and Alva Maria. Greta's arrival was somewhat unexpected. This third child piled more weight onto the financial burdens her parents already faced in raising her older siblings. Before Greta was born, her parents had met and married in Stockholm. Her father had moved there from Frinyard, a small village, while her mother had come from Hogsby. Both had grown up in deep poverty and continued to struggle financially. They lived in a modest three-bedroom apartment where her father took on various jobs, including butcher's assistant, factory worker, grocer, and street cleaner. Garbo later described her early life in Stockholm as quiet and rather sad, saying, it was eternally gray, those long winter's nights. My father would be sitting in a corner, scribbling figures on a newspaper. On the other side of the room, my mother is repairing ragged old clothes, sighing. We children would be talking in very low voices, or just sitting silently. We were filled with anxiety, as if there were danger in the air. Such evenings are unforgettable for a sensitive girl, but also for a girl like me. Where we lived, all the houses and apartments looked alike, their ugliness matched by everything surrounding us. Garbo was naturally shy and was not particularly fond of school or playing with other children. However, she had a vivid imagination and was a natural leader among her small circle of friends. From an early age, she was drawn to the theater and make-believe, leading her and her friends in games and amateur performances. Her dream was to become an actress, a passion strong enough that she spent whatever money she had to watch local stage performances at the Mosbach Theater. In 1914, when World War I erupted, Greta Garbo was busy singing in her local church choir and sought her mom. Despite Sweden's official stance of armed neutrality and continued trade with both the Entente and Central Powers, the nation was internally tense with a strong pro-German sentiment among its political leaders. Sweden, not a military power, was vulnerable to any aggression from major nations like Britain, Germany, France, or its historical adversary, Russia. However, it was the US entry into the war that most threatened Sweden's populace. The Swedish government's decision to keep trading iron ore with Germany led to a British and American blockade of food imports into Sweden causing widespread food shortages, especially affecting the poor communities like Sodder Mom. The resulting riots eventually led to the fall of the conservative government and its replacement by a social democratic regime, an ideology which has largely dominated Sweden's political landscape ever since. Garbo completed her formal education at age 13 and typical for working class Swedish girls of her time, did not pursue high school education she later said she was only sad as a child for as long as I can think back. I did some skating and played with snowballs, but most of all, I wanted to be alone with myself. Garbo's first teenage crush was Danish performer Carl Brisson, a former boxer who came to Sodermom with his review. 
She went to see him perform and waited backstage to give him a bunch of violets. Risen not only signed her autograph, but also gave her a card that allowed her to attend any of his shows. One evening, he shone the spotlight on her and invited her to sing a chorus of his song on stage. Although shy and blushing, Garbo sang in front of a real audience for the first time. Garbo's love for the theater was sincere, and by the age of 13, she had formed her own theatrical group called The Attic Theater. She organized her friends to bring old furniture from their homes for props and used whatever they could find for costumes. At the war's end, Sweden faced not only the ongoing food crisis and the emerging threat of Bolshevism from the East, but also the arrival of the Spanish flu in 1919. Greta's father contracted the illness and became severely ill, forcing him to stop working. Her mother had to go out to work to support the family alone, and Garbo became her father's nurse. She caught the disease herself and was bedridden. She recovered, but her father tragically did not. The death of her father left her in serious grief. She also now would have to go out to work to help the family. She found work in a barber shop, lathering men's faces for their daily shaves. She then moved to a position as a saleswoman at the Swedish department store. Greta's beauty made her a perfect model for the store's women's hats and advertising campaigns. Her first experience in front of a movie camera came at age 15, when she was in an advertorial film for the department store. At that time, Sweden had a flourishing film industry, and with Stockholm being a relatively small city, her face was soon noticed by local movie makers. At 17, she appeared in the Swedish comedy Peter the Tramp, where she played a small but important role. After this, she was admitted to Stockholm's Royal Dramatic Theater, where she was trained in a methodical approach in the semiotics of movement and gesture. Some of her notes from this period still exist, detailing observations like, the head bent forward equals a mild concession or a condescending attitude, and the throwing back of the head signifies a violent feeling such as love. These early lessons and expression would become her trademark gestures on the big screens of Hollywood many years later. Such a destiny must have seemed unimaginable, especially to an impoverished girl in faraway Sweden at that time. She studied there for only a year before being discovered in the spring of 1923 by the well-known film director Marit Stiller, who was searching for talent for his new project, an epic adaptation of the Swedish novel the story of Gosta Berling, written by Nobel laureate Selma Lagerlöf. Stiller, who was of Jewish descent and had fled Finland to avoid conscription into the Russian Tsar's army, had a major influence on Garbo's life and career. Although their relationship was likely purely professional, Stiller was gay. Their connection was life-changing for both. Stiller was known for his imposing height, taste for fur coats and bright yellow sports cars, and commanding presence. His flamboyant lifestyle and assertive directorial approach made him something of a Svengali to the young Garbo. Stiller was harshly critical of Garbo's weight. He was also very controlling, often screaming instructions at her or ignoring her completely. On set, his yelling would sometimes reduce her to tears in front of the entire crew. Stiller openly declared his goal of reshaping Garbo into the actress he envisioned. Rather than breaking her spirit, this tough treatment seemed to sharpen Garbo. She responded well, having already felt plenty of life's harsh realities. She soon learned how to turn the tables on Stiller and have him at her mercy instead. Regardless, Stiller was one of Garbo's earliest believers. At a time when many dismissed her as this little nobody, Stiller saw potential. Garbo's debut film was a major success in Germany and Sweden, launching her to fame after just one film. She continued to collaborate with Stiller, who not only coaxed her, but was also the one who suggested she change her last name from Gustafsson to Garbo. During this time, Garbo also formed another important relationship with Mimi Polak, a fellow student at the Royal Dramatic Theater School in Stockholm and a Swedish film and stage actress. Their intimate relationship was later revealed through letters exchanged over 60 years, it is clear from the letters that their relationship began as a romantic affair before developing into a lifelong friendship. In her letters, Garbo affectionately referred to Polak as Mimosa. 
In 1925, Garbo starred in another film, Streets of Sorrow, in Germany, directed by G.W. Pabst, by then a prominent director in Weimar cinema. The film was a morality tale where she played a prostitute who suffers the consequences of her actions. Garbo acted alongside Asta Nielsen, the Danish icon and one of the first globally recognized movie stars. Nielsen's ability left an impression on Garbo, who humbly said, in terms of expression and versatility, I am nothing to her. The film caught the attention of Louis B. Mayer, in one way or another, though accounts vary on how Greta Garbo first secured her contract with him. At the time, Mayer was the vice president and general manager of Metro Goldwyn Mayer, Victor Seastrom, a well-respected Swedish director at MGM and a friend of Stiller, encouraged Mayer to meet Stiller during a trip to Berlin. There are two contemporary accounts of what happened next. In one account, Mayer, who was always on the lookout for new talent, had taken an interest in Stiller after doing some research. Stiller insisted that any contract include Garbo, believing she would enhance his career. Mayer eventually agreed to a private screening of Gosta Berling, Struck by Garbo's charisma, he reportedly then shifted his interest from Stiller to Garbo. It was her eyes, Mayer's daughter later remembered him saying. According to another count, Mayer had already seen Gosta Berling before his Berlin trip and was more interested in Garbo than Stiller from the start. On the way to the screening, Mayer mentioned to his daughter, this director is wonderful, but what we really ought to look at is the girl. After the screening, he was adamant, declaring, I'll take her without him, I'll take her with him, number one is the girl. In any case, July 1925, the duo arrived in the sweltering heat of summertime New York, aboard the SS Drottning home. Garbo's favorite memory from the trip was reportedly riding the roller coaster at Coney Island, but she was less than impressed with the rest of her time there. She and Stiller lived in New York for six months, during which they heard nothing from Metro Goldwyn Mayer. After this frustrating and depressing period, they decided to head to Hollywood on their own. Still, after several more weeks without any news from MGM, they nearly considered returning to Sweden. Garbo wrote about her depression in America to her Swedish boyfriend, lamenting, It is bitter to think of one's best years disappearing in this unpolished country. A mutual friend in Los Angeles eventually helped by connecting them with Irving Thalberg, a producer at MGM. Thalberg was impressed enough by Garbo's screen test to consider her for silent film roles right away. He decided to refine her image for Hollywood, arranging English lessons, dental work, and a diet to lose weight. Although Garbo was somewhat resistant to these changes, she complied. The studio executives at MGM gave Garbo a very limited opportunity to prove herself. They signed the Swedish actress for two films, Torrent and The Temptress, with the understanding that if these films did not perform well financially, her contract would not be renewed for a second year. Motion Picture hailed her debut as a complete success, writing, She is not so much an actress as she is endowed with individuality and magnetism. Garbo quickly became a favorite among fans for her refusal to play the same game as other stars. She had an aversion to the usual publicity stunts and mildly provocative photo shoots that other stars endured. As she rose in fame, she declared to an interviewer, I will no longer shake hands with prize fighters and egg and milk men so they will have pictures to put in the papers. Instead, she preferred to work with skilled portrait photographers who captured her beauty with dramatic, magnificent lighting. After just two movies in the US, Garbo had become a star. She capped off 1926 by starring in Flesh and the Devil, opposite John Gilbert, one of the biggest box office draws of the day. This third American film solidified her status as an international sensation. The film centered around a love triangle involving two best friends. They were played by Gilbert and the handsome Swedish actor, Lars Hansen, with Garbo as the point of the triangle. Flesh and the Devil notoriously featured some of the most sensual scenes ever filmed in Hollywood up to that point. One particularly erotic scene shows Garbo rolling a cigarette between her lips before passing it to Gilbert, maintaining eye contact as he lights it, illuminating their faces. Another scene has her lying back in wild abandon on a couch, with Gilbert's head resting in her lap, 
lifting her hand to drag her fingers across his mouth. Gilbert drinks from the communion chalice, and Garbo, taking it next, drinks from the same spot. Her expression, one of slow burning ecstasy as her lips touch the place his had just been. Their on-screen chemistry was not just acting. They had fallen in love for real, creating one of Hollywood's most erotically charged relationships. One legendary story from their passionate affair involves a love scene in Flesh and the Devil. Director Clarence Brown, noticing their real passion, refused to call cut. Instead, he gradually dimmed the lights and discreetly cleared the set of crew members. A few hours later, he even had dinner sent to the couple on set, assuming they would have developed an appetite by then. Their story, however, is a melancholic one, largely because John Gilbert cuts such a tragic figure. He is often cited as one of the most prominent actors who failed to transition successfully to talkies, supposedly because his voice was too weak. This, however, is a myth. His voice was actually quite adequate. Gilbert's real challenge was that his forte was portraying youthful lovers, a type of role that fell out of favor during the Depression era, which preferred gangsters, sharp dialogue, and musicals. In Flesh and the Devil, he was in his prime. They soon moved in together and shared a home for almost two years. He reportedly even planted a stand of trees on his property in the Hollywood Hills to remind her of Sweden's forests and proposed to her multiple times. In fact, Garbo and Gilbert were supposed to have a double wedding with director King Vidor and his fiancée Eleanor Boardman. However, Garbo developed cold feet and backed out at the last minute, despite later admitting that she truly loved him, probably her most forthright declaration of affection. Eventually, Garbo and Gilbert reconciled and became friends. Garbo's seeming aloofness was actually a mix of awkwardness, disorientation, and grief. When she first arrived in the U.S., she barely spoke English, and within a year, she received the heartbreaking news that her sister, who also aspired to be an actress, had died of cancer back in Sweden. Furthermore, Stiller, her mentor and confidant, struggled to adapt to Hollywood and was not chosen to direct Garbo's first American film. Garbo wrote of her unhappiness in a letter to a friend in Sweden, describing America as ugly, ugly, all machine. It is excruciating. The only solace she found was in sending money home to her family. Early in her career, she found herself thrust into an intense spotlight, a level of fame that was overwhelming and new, not just to her, but to the world. Athletic by nature and often restless, she developed a habit of taking long nighttime walks under a large hat pulled low over her face. Stiller, perhaps feeling that his young protege no longer needed his guidance, returned to Sweden. He passed away from pleurisy in 1928 at the age of 45, reportedly holding a photograph of her close to his heart. Stiller appeared to harbor no resentment towards Garbo's meteoric rise to fame. He only wished for her happiness and success. When Garbo returned to Sweden to mourn him, she visited a storehouse holding his belongings. There, she touched his personal items, softly recalling her memories with him, an experience that likely inspired a scene in Queen Christina, where her character tenderly interacts with objects that remind her of a lost lover. At this time, a story emerged that Stiller and Garbo had in fact married in Constantinople when she was still a teenager and kept the entire relationship a secret so that it would not damage her image. It was reported she returned to Sweden to claim her share of Stiller's large estate, although these claims have never been corroborated by any evidence. This period of loss closely followed the death of another dear friend, her first co-star, Einar Hansen. Stiller had eerily predicted Hansen's death in a car accident, which tragically occurred just months before Stiller's own death. In 1927, Garbo and Gilbert starred together again in Love, a film based on Anna Karenina. The film was promoted to be as steamy as their first collaboration and was initially titled Heat. The bold title was meant to be displayed as Greta Garbo and John Gilbert in Heat across theaters nationwide but it was toned down to Garbo and Gilbert in love to ease concerns from the rising censorship movements. The adaptation loosely, some would say far too loosely, followed Tolstoy's novel and featured two endings, one where Karenina finds happiness and another where she takes her own life. 
American audiences saw the uplifting version, while European viewers were shown the somber one. A neat illustration of the cultural differences between the two audiences, if ever there was one. Their third film together was A Woman of Affairs, which elevated Garbo's fame even higher, now surpassing Lillian Gish at the box office to become the biggest star of them all. The film centers on Diana, played by Garbo, who loves a man she cannot be with, and eventually marries their mutual childhood friend, only to end her own life. Gilbert provided a warm contrast to Garbo's cool on-screen presence, and off-screen he became a mentor in her life. He not only fine-tuned her acting skills, but also taught her how to maneuver through the complexities of Hollywood, from schmoozing at social events to dealing with hard-headed studio executives. Critics were effusive in their praise of Garbo's on-screen presence. They quickly latched on to her distinctive ability to communicate emotions in silent films using just her eyes, a vital skill for an actress unable to use her voice. In 1929, Pierre de Rohan of the New York Telegraph remarked, she had glamour and fascination for both sexes, which have never been equaled on the screen. At the outset of her Hollywood career in silent films, Garbo was frequently typecast as a vamp. Such roles filled with adultery and divorce were immensely popular with post-World War I audiences who were experiencing a powerful urge to liberate themselves from the old, pre-war world. The Great War had been a sharp reminder that youth was short, fragile, and not to be wasted. However, Garbo quickly grew tired of these parts, stating, I cannot see any sense in dressing up and doing nothing but tempting men. Away from the camera, she preferred a more casual appearance than the high glamour she portrayed on screen. She favored slacks, men's Oxford shoes, and plain sweaters. Her wardrobe was filled with men's tailored shirts and ties, and she often identified with masculine titles, even signing her letters as Harry or Harry Boy. Garbo also expressed a desire to play more interesting male roles, like St. Francis of Assisi, complete with a beard, and the eternally youthful Dorian Gray from Oscar Wilde's novel. In 1926, she was rumored to be involved with actress Lillian Tashman, and Louise Brooks later claimed to have had a relationship with her. Naturally reserved about her private life, Garbo was even more discreet about her romantic involvements with women. While working on her early films, she insisted on privacy during shoots, often requesting screens or black flats around her to block others from viewing her performances. She believed she could achieve greater expressive freedom when unobserved, once stating, If I am by myself, my face will do things I cannot do with it otherwise. According to director Ruben Mamoulian, with whom she worked on Queen Christina, Garbo had stringent rules for filming intimate scenes, allowing only essential personnel like the cameraman and lighting technician on set, while the director was expected to head out with the crew to go and buy milkshakes. Mamoulian insisted on staying, apparently not tempted by the milkshake, and Garbo relented on this occasion. Garbo's diet was notably unconventional, guided by celebrity nutritionist Gaylord Hauser. The Hauser diet included a regimen of vegetables, celery loaf, wheat germ, yogurt, yeast, molasses, and buttermilk. This was considered an extremely unconventional diet in the U.S. at the time. Hauser made plenty of enemies in the government, health authorities and media at the time for daring to suggest that refined sugar and white flour were unhealthy for the body. But Garbo was a fan, and they became close friends. Occasionally contravening Hauser's strict dietary guidelines, she sometimes indulged in simpler pleasures like tuna sandwiches, triscuits, and cheese. MGM's executives could hardly criticize Garbo's idiosyncratic behavior and her intense desire for privacy, as she was proving to be extremely profitable for them. Her first three films were so successful that they accounted for a remarkable 13% of the studio's total profits during those years. Garbo, aware of her growing influence at MGM, threatened to return to Sweden unless they increased her salary. The studio complied, paying her $270,000 per film and granting her greater control over her roles and the projects she chose. Fred Niblo directed Garbo in The Mysterious Lady, opposite Conrad Nagel. 
in the film, which is based on Ludwig Wolf's novel, War in the Dark, she plays a mysterious woman who charms a man at a sold-out opera performance, and then spends a romantic day with him. This was followed by Wild Orchids, where Garbo played Lily, a young woman married to an older man, John Sterling, played by Louis Stone, who takes her to Java to invest in the tea plantations. As a husband, he is neglectful, leaving his young wife deeply frustrated. In 1929, Garbo also starred in The Single Standard, a film about a woman advocating for the same standards of behavior to be applied to both men and women. In her relationships, she wants freedom, honesty, and equality, a role that perhaps more closely mirrored Garbo's personal views on gender roles than many of her previous parts. Garbo's last silent film, The Kiss, was also MGM's final silent production. In The Kiss, she played a traditional role as an unhappily married young woman who falls in love with another man, again played by Conrad Nagel. Garbo remained an enigma to the public, largely because she refused to grant interviews. Men and women alike were drawn to Garbo, who played vulnerable, passionate, and sensual characters on screen, yet revealed very little about her personal life. In one of her rare interviews, she once explained, being a movie star, and this applies to all of them, means being looked at from every possible direction. You are never left at peace. You're just fair game. If you want to get more in-depth into the life of Greta Garbo, then this book, Garbo, Her Life, Her Films, by Robert Gottlieb, is our top choice. Gottlieb is one of the greatest movie critics alive today, and this book is clearly a labor of love and the final word on the Swedish Sphinx. We have a link to it down in the description below, and if you buy a copy from the link, we get a small commission at no extra cost to you. This is a huge help to the channel, so thank you for that. It also features on our Amazon store page list of the 20 best books about the silent era, which is also linked down below, along with our top three choices for Garbo films. This Blu-ray version of Camille is especially fantastic. I hope you enjoy these recommendations. Let us know what you think of them, but let's get back to Garbo mania. For her entry into sound films, MGM chose to give her a role in Anna Christie, the studio promoted the film with the legendary tagline, Garbo Talks. These two words have become a marker for a new age and seem to be weighted with the promise of some deep revelation about the most mysterious star. Finally, she would have to give away at least something, her speaking voice. The film, adapted by Francis Marion and produced by Irving Thalberg and Paul Byrne, featured Garbo as Anna, a troubled young woman reconnecting with her estranged father while hiding her past as a brothel worker. Garbo's first spoken words in the film, delivered 16 minutes in, were memorable. Gimme a whiskey, ginger ale on the side, and don't be stingy, baby. Her performance was well received, with Mordaunt Hall of the New York Times noting that Garbo was even more interesting through being heard than she was in her mute portrayals. The film turned out to be the biggest box office hit of that year. For her role as Anna, Garbo earned her first Oscar nomination for Best Actress. Although she did not win, losing to Norma Shearer, she was also nominated for her role in Romance in 1930, playing Rita Cavallini, a famous Italian opera star. Following Romance, Garbo starred in a German-language version of Anna Christie, directed by a different team and cast, including Hans Jungermann and Salka Fiertel. This version was just as successful as the English one, making her an international talkie star. Garbo was known for her financial prudence. In fact, she was often seen as stingy compared to the more financially extravagant and generous American stars. She had saved her earnings in a single Beverly Hills bank, which backfired when the 1929 crash wiped out her account, apparently leaving her penniless. Fortunately, her services were in high demand in the sound era, and she would soon rebuild her vast fortune. In 1931, Garbo continued to dominate the box office. MGM capitalized on her fame by pairing her with Robert Montgomery in Inspiration where she played a Parisian artist model and kept woman. She also boosted Clark Gable's early career in Susan Lennox's Her Fall and Rise, playing an illegitimate child from an abusive home who runs away with an architect, played by Gable. 
Garbo and Gable did not gel off screen. She found his acting wooden, while he considered her a stuck-up snob. In 1931 and 1932, Greta Garbo took on her two most iconic roles. First, she starred as Mata Hari alongside Ramon Navarro. This movie was so popular that it caused riots and mass hysteria among crowds eager to see it. Theaters were forced to call the police to maintain order. The film was a massive success, becoming not only MGM's biggest hit of the year, but also the financial pinnacle of Garbo's career. The following year, Garbo appeared as Russian ballerina Grusinskaya in Grand Hotel, a film that occupies a special place in cinematic history. It is notable for introducing the concept of an all-star ensemble cast, and is the only film to have won the Best Picture Academy Award without any other nominations. It is also known for being the first film to feature Lionel and John Barrymore together. In this movie, Garbo famously delivered the line, I want to be let alone. In the public, a classic Mandela effect took place, and it became folklore that Garbo had stated more simply, I want to be alone. Even though it was a line of dialogue, this is now the misquote most often associated with her. She clarified years later by explaining, I never said I want to be alone. I only said I want to be let alone. There is all the difference. Garbo's intense on-screen chemistry with John Barrymore was another highlight of Grand Hotel. She insisted that their romantic scenes be shot on a particularly intimate set, leading to an incident where they continued their lovemaking, unaware of the director's call to cut for a full three minutes. Grand Hotel was also praised for its artistic achievements in art direction and production design, particularly the innovative 360-degree lobby set that allowed audiences a dynamic view of the hotel's activities. The movie was a huge commercial hit, earning huge profits in both the US and international markets. During the same period, in 1931, Garbo met the writer Mercedes de Acosta. This was the start of a love affair that lasted for several years. Garbo, known for her aversion to marriage, was pursued by various famous figures throughout the 1930s. Her romantic life included real or rumored relationships with a wide variety of personalities, including Johnny Weissmuller, Adams family creator Charles Adams, hairstylist Sidney Guleroff, actresses Eva La Gallian, and Cecile de Rothschild, and also involved in platonic marriages with figures like Noel Coward and Gaylord Hauser. Louise Brooks described her fleeting romantic encounter with Greta Garbo, stating, In 1928, when I met Garbo at Alice Glazer's, we sat facing each other closely across a narrow breakfast table. Her gaze was so intense and so eloquent that I left after an hour, although I had intended to spend the afternoon. She made a pass at me. Garbo is a completely masculine dyke, which makes her films ever more wonderful. Dissatisfied with the roles offered by MGM, Garbo brought them a script by da Costa about Joan of Arc. However, MGM was hesitant to cast her as such a dark and historical figure, opting instead to pair her with Melvin Douglas in As You Desire Me, much to Garbo's disappointment. The film features Garbo as Zara, a bar dancer and alcoholic in Budapest, who is confronted by a man claiming she's actually Maria, his friend's wife who lost her memory during the World War I invasion. Garbo, known for her icy demeanor on set, sometimes acted with unexpected altruism. As You Desire Me was her last film under her contract with MGM, but instead of causing tension or negotiating for more money, she spent her time on set supporting her co-star, Eric von Stroheim. Von Stroheim, a famous European director, dismissed and mistreated by studios, was unofficially banned from the MGM lot. Yet Garbo insisted on his participation in the film and claimed illness to halt production when in fact, he was the one who was too unwell and depressed to continue. This movie was the first of three she would do with Melvin Douglas. After its completion, Garbo returned to Sweden as her contract with MGM had ended and what was something of a power move to force the studio to meet her demands by letting them have a taste of what life was like out her. After nearly a year of negotiations, Garbo decided to renew her contract with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer for $300,000 per film. She also wanted to make the movie Queen Christina through MGM, a project MGM was reluctant to produce. 
The studio preferred to cast her opposite Laurence Olivier or Charles Boyer, but Garbo insisted on John Gilbert, her former lover. MGM gave in and Queen Christina became a critical and box office smash, the highest grossing film of that year. Garbo's insistence on casting Gilbert seems to be another case of her being driven by altruism. He had practically retired from acting, and when she requested his involvement in Queen Christina, MGM was compelled to offer him another contract. Gilbert was also newly married with a child on the way, but his health was deteriorating, as he frequently suffered from severe physical symptoms due to his drinking. He was, by this point, vomiting blood, and it was clear that he was facing an early grave. Nonetheless, when Garbo was questioned about her closeness to Gilbert, she was characteristically dismissive. I don't know what I ever saw in him, she said. He was very pretty, I suppose. The movie also stirred up controversy for its portrayal of the fictional life of Queen Christina of Sweden, who ascended to the throne in 1632 at age six and became a powerful and influential monarch. American movie censors objected to scenes where Garbo's character, Queen Christina, disguises herself as a man and kisses another woman. During this period, Garbo developed a strong friendship with actress and screenwriter Salka Firtol, who greatly influenced her career decisions. Firtol not only helped write several of Garbo's films, but also advised her on which projects to pursue and with whom to collaborate. Many of the projects Fertile recommended had strong European appeal, but seemed not to work well in the US. In 1934, Garbo starred in The Painted Veil, in which she played the daughter of an Austrian medical professor who feels isolated and longs for excitement. She marries without love and moves to Hong Kong where she falls for another man. The next year, Garbo took on the title role in Anna Karenina, one of her most renowned roles insisting on a version that adhered more closely to the classic novel than her earlier adaptation, Love. She delivered a performance that won the New York Film Critics Circle Award for Best Actress. The film premiered at New York's Capitol Theater, a venue known for prestigious MGM premieres, and was a success both domestically and internationally. It won the Mussolini Cup for Best Foreign Film at the Venice Film Festival. Writing for The Spectator in 1935, British novelist Graham Greene praised Garbo's compelling performance. It is Greta Garbo's personality which makes this film, which fills the mold of the neat respectful adaptation with some kind of sense of the greatness of the novel. Helen Brown Norden noted in Vanity Fair, against the glittering background, these people move to their inevitable doom. There seems more of anguish and more of somber depth in this version than there was in the old silent film with Garbo and John Gilbert. Garbo, still with that remote look of the implacable Aphrodite on her face, acts with a dignity and a bitter passion which reach a mature climax in the final scene. Next, Garbo starred alongside Robert Taylor and Lionel Barrymore in the 1936 romantic drama Camille, directed by Georges Cocor. Set in early 1800s France, the film tells the story of Marguerite Gautier, who rises from a lower class background to fame in high society. Producer Irving Thalberg was determined to see that the film did not come across as just another stiff period piece, and Garbo's notably sincere performance is often hailed as one of her finest. Camille was a major success, becoming Garbo's favorite film of her own and earning her another Best Actress Academy Award nomination. Garbo was hesitant about doing Camille, fearing it was too similar to Anna Karenina. She was more interested in a film about Marie Waleska, Napoleon's mistress, but she cut a deal with Thalberg to make this film and then the Waleska picture. Garbo grew close to Thalberg and his wife during the project. However, partway through filming, Thalberg shockingly died of pneumonia at the age of 37. This loss, coupled with the death of John Gilbert just before Thalberg's passing, sent her into a period of grief and depression. Following Camille, Garbo starred as Marie Waleska in Conquest, as per her agreement with the late Thalberg. Despite its lavish production and extensive publicity, the film was a financial disaster, losing almost 1.4 million and becoming Garbo's biggest flop in one of MGM's most unsuccessful films of the Depression era. She had had an almost perfect run of successes, 
She was the biggest star in the world, but now with this first failure, the wolves were quickly out for Garbo. Garbo mania was about to be brought to a swift end. In Hollywood, a memorable line can become iconic, whether it's from a movie, a tagline, or an interview quote. In 1938, the term box office poison began to emerge. It cast a shadow across a whole constellation of stars, including Garbo. While industry insiders were frantically searching for ways to draw audiences back to movie theaters, the Independent Theater Owners Association placed the blame on certain movie stars and the studios that paid them what ITOA considered excessive salaries. On May 3rd, 1938, ITOA published a notorious full-page ad in The Hollywood Reporter, labeling Mae West, Edward Arnold, Greta Garbo, Joan Crawford, Marlena Dietrich, Catherine Hepburn, and Kay Francis, among others, as box office poison. The term box office poison quickly became a sensational topic in the press, even though it was merely a trade publication ad aimed at industry professionals, it gained widespread attention beyond its intended audience. Within four days of its publication, over 30 newspapers nationwide had reported on the ad, with some outlets running multiple stories. Until 1937, Garbo was considered a valuable asset to MGM, anything but box office poison. Her 1926 film, The Temptress, lost $43,000, which was the only financial setback until the loss of $1.4 million on Conquest. To put these figures in context, when adjusted for inflation to 2024 values, the Temptress lost about $600,000 compared to $25 million on Conquest. After this loss, her contract expired and she returned to Sweden once more. It was during this period in Europe that she met Leopold Stokowski, the then conductor of the Philadelphia Orchestra. The two had a highly publicized relationship while traveling across Europe in 1937, though it remains unclear whether their relationship was romantic or platonic. The financial disaster of Conquest was a severe blow to both Garbo and MGM. The studio concluded that the main issue was Garbo's waning popularity. To revitalize her image, they decided to shift her to comedy roles, partnering her with legendary producer-director Ernst Lubitsch. Garbo was cast in Ninochka. The film depicted the Soviet Union under Joseph Stalin as bleak and oppressive, and was one of the first in Hollywood to do so. It was contrasted sharply with the lively and colorful society of pre-World War II Paris. The film's marketing played off her previous sound introduction with Garbo Talks by promoting it with the new tagline, Garbo Laughs aiming to transform her sultry, exotic image into a more lighthearted and humorous on-screen persona. While Nanochka was successful in the US, it was unsurprisingly banned in the Soviet Union and did not perform as well as her earlier films internationally. In 1941, Greta Garbo took on a dual role in Two-Faced Women. In Two-Faced Woman, she portrayed Karen Borg Blake, a woman who pretends to be her own imaginary twin sister to recapture the affection of her husband, played by Melvin Douglas. This role required Garbo to show off her versatility by dancing, skiing, and swimming while also differentiating between the twin characters' distinct personalities. The film's tone echoed the dual personality comedies that Marion Davies popularized in the 1920s. Two-Faced Woman earned Garbo the National Board of Review of Motion Pictures Best Acting Award. However, Garbo herself did not view the film favorably, famously calling it her grave. Following the disappointing release of Two-Faced Woman, Garbo decided to step away from acting. This was the start of her retirement from the film industry. This decision wasn't planned initially as she continued to explore potential new projects. However, the outbreak of World War II stymied the development of films she was interested in. Even though she was just 36 and still one of Hollywood's brightest stars, Garbo never returned to the silver screen. She agreed to star in The Girl from Leningrad for MGM without a binding contract, but this project never materialized. She remained in Sweden, planning to resume her acting career after the war. 
During her time in Sweden, Garbo became involved in activities that began a wild range of speculation about the nature of her role during the war. She allegedly gathered intelligence on Nazi sympathizers in Sweden for the British Secret Intelligence Service, and was rumored to have facilitated communication between British agents and the Swedish king. This narrative overlaps confusingly with the life of Juan Pujol Garcia, a Spanish double agent for Britain known by the codename Garbo. Garcia was loyal to Britain, having become disgusted by both communism and fascism during the Spanish Civil War. Garcia became known as the finest spy of the war, and his own myth has become entwined with the real Garbo over time, at least according to some sensational stories. It seems quite improbable that one of the world's most recognizable figures would be employed as a spy. Nonetheless, British spy chief William Stevenson claimed that Garbo did indeed help identify major Nazi collaborators in Stockholm. According to author Charles Hyam, who reviewed declassified U.S. government files, Garbo began cooperating with British intelligence in 1939 through director Alexander Korda, who recruited several celebrities for the war effort. Garbo is said to have acted as a liaison for the British with the businessman Axel Johnson and the Swedish royal family, and was credited with aiding the escape of physicist Niels Bohr from occupied Denmark to Sweden, and subsequently to America, where he joined the Manhattan Project. If true, these actions cast Garbo in the light of a real-life Mata Hari, albeit in a more redemptive role. Throughout it all, Garbo maintained her private nature regarding her wartime activities. She avoided public war bond rallies, USO tours, and Hollywood's wartime canteen, keeping her personal views on the war to herself. It is well documented today that on December 12, 1939, Garbo wrote a check for $5,000 to the Finnish Relief Fund to support its war orphans program during the Winter War when Stalin invaded Finland. She insisted on making the donation anonymously. As the war intensified, however, she faced growing criticism for her perceived lack of involvement, particularly her absence from war bond drives and entertainment efforts for the troops. A story even circulated that she had denied an autograph to a GI amputee, an incident confirmed by actor-director Orson Welles. Living as neighbors in Brentwood during the war, Wills recalled seeing Garbo refuse a soldier's request outside a restaurant, exclaiming, That is how dumb she was. She refused him, in front of my eyes. On another note, Garbo once confided to friends about receiving a fan letter from Adolf Hitler. She reportedly wondered what it would be like to meet the dictator face to face. Early in World War II, she learned that Hitler was a fan of her movie Camille and had guaranteed its widespread distribution in Germany, despite the Jewish background of its director, George Kukor. Hitler had even kept hold of a private copy of the film seized by his customs officials. Garbo equally expressed a desire to meet Hitler, hoping she might persuade him to end the war. She believed in the influential power of her personality to change history, or failing that, she declared, if not, I could shoot him. She realized that no one would dare to search her if she were invited by Hitler himself. This notion of Garbo planning to assassinate Hitler seems far-fetched, but her friend Sam Green insisted it was true, recalling her words, Mr. Hitler was big on me. He kept writing and inviting me to come to Germany, and if the war hadn't started when it did, I would have gone, and I would have taken a gun out of my purse and shot him, because I'm the only person who would not have been searched. When World War II ended in 1945, Greta Garbo found herself both eager and apprehensive about returning to acting. At 40 years old, she felt her appearance had declined and doubted she could maintain her former screen allure. Some argue that the failure of Two-Faced Woman was a critical blow to Garbo's career, but those closest to her viewed it as merely one of several factors. Throughout her career, Garbo famously shunned Hollywood social events, preferring solitude or the company of close friends. She avoided signing autographs, responding to fan mail, or giving interviews. She also never attended Oscar ceremonies, even when nominated. Her need for privacy was deeply rooted. In a 1928 interview, she admitted, As early as I can remember, I have wanted to be alone. I've always been moody. I detest crowds. I don't like many people. 
and a 1937 letter to Salka Vertol. Garbo confessed, I go nowhere, see no one. It is hard and sad to be alone, but sometimes it's even more difficult to be with someone. In another letter in 1970, she wrote a feeling perpetually out of sorts. I feel very tired and cannot seem to get myself together to plan where to go. I am sorry, but something always seems to go a little wrong with me, and it is not in my head either. Tennessee Williams described her as the saddest of creatures, an artist who abandons her art. However, in 1948, Garbo tried to revive her acting career with producer Walter Wenger, who had previously worked with her on Queen Christina. They planned to adapt Honoré Balzac's La Duchesse de Langueil into a film. She underwent multiple screen tests and even traveled to Rome in 1949 to start filming but the project was scrapped due to lack of funding. These screen tests turned out to be her final appearances before a camera. Garbo was also offered the role of Norma Desmond in Billy Wilder's Sunset Boulevard. After meeting with the film's producer, Charles Brackett, she ultimately decided not to proceed with the project, and Gloria Swanson was cast instead. Throughout the 1940s, particularly post-war, Garbo was approached for various film roles but rejected most. On the rare occasions she agreed to a part, she would habitually withdraw from the project if any personal or professional issues arose. In retirement, Greta Garbo lived a private and simple life, staring clear of public engagements and avoiding the spotlight she so disliked. However, she had numerous friends and acquaintances with whom she socialized and traveled, although it's noted that in her later years, she became more selective about her circle, trusting fewer people. Whenever asked about returning to acting, her typical response was unenthusiastic. I have made enough faces, she once said to David Niven. Garbo often felt uncertain about how to occupy her time, frequently wrestling with her eccentricities and a persistent melancholy. In 1946, she told reporters, I have no plans, either for the movies or anything else. I'm just drifting. As her 60th birthday approached in 1965, she confided to a friend about a perpetual sadness that she felt would never leave her. In 1971, she admitted to another friend, I suppose I suffer from very deep depression. One biographer suggested that she might have suffered from bipolar disorder, evidenced by her own words in 1933, I am very happy one moment, the next there is nothing left for me. Starting in the 1940s, Garbo began collecting art. While some pieces in her collection were not particularly valuable, she also owned important works by Renoir, Rualt, Kandinsky, Bernard, and Jolensky. By the time of her death in 1990, her art collection was valued in the millions of dollars. On February 9, 1951, Garbo became a naturalized U.S. citizen and in 1953 purchased a seven-room apartment in Manhattan, where she lived for the remainder of her life. Her apartment's buzzer was marked only with a G, and its interior was described as a light and airy study in pink. She valued her privacy so much that she preferred to be addressed as Miss Harriet Brown. Close friends were allowed to call her Miss Garbo or Gigi, but she would not respond if they called her Greta. Garbo was good friends with dancer Devi Cha, who taught her Indonesian traditional dance, and they would perform together in private. She was not entirely reclusive, if the right offer was forthcoming. Garbo was a guest at the White House on November 13, 1963, experiencing what she later described as a magical evening, just days before the assassination of President Kennedy. In 1969, Italian director Lucchino Visconti considered casting Garbo as Maria Sofia, Queen of Naples, in his adaptation of Proust's Remembrance of Things Past. He was enthusiastic about her fitting into the decadent atmosphere of Proust's world, saying, I am very pleased with the idea that this woman, with her severe and authoritarian presence, should figure in the decadent and rarefied climate of the world described by Proust. However, there is no concrete evidence that Garbo was genuinely interested in the role. 
In 1971, Greta Garbo spent her vacation in southern France at the summer home of her friend and possible lover, Baroness Cecile de Rothschild, who introduced her to Samuel Adams Green, a New York City art collector and curator. Green became a friend and walking companion for Garbo. Known for recording all of his phone calls, Green also taped many conversations with Garbo, with her consent. However, their friendship ended in 1981, after Garbo was seemingly mistakenly informed that Green had shared these recordings with others. In his will, Green left these tapes to Wesleyan University's film archives in 2011. These recordings provide incredible insights into Garbo's private personality, her sense of humor, and her idiosyncrasies. In her later years, Garbo maintained a close relationship with her cook and housekeeper of 31 years, Claire Coger, who described their relationship as sister-like. Garbo continued her habit of taking long walks, often alone through New York City, dressed casually and shielded by large sunglasses. This routine turned Garbo watching into a popular activity among photographers and New Yorkers, yet she rigorously guarded her privacy until the end. In fact, Norwegian actress Liv Ullman, once called the new Greta Garbo, encountered Garbo on the streets of New York in 1977 and attempted to catch up with her to tell her that she was playing Anna Christie on Broadway. Garbo fled into Central Park, looking frightened, forcing Ullman to seize her pursuit. Respecting Garbo's apparent distress, Ullman said, Yes, she outpaced me, but when she turned and looked so frightened, I gave up and didn't follow her. I was younger. I could have made it, but I didn't. Diagnosed with breast cancer in 1984, she underwent successful treatment. Later in life, she needed regular dialysis, attending sessions three times a week at the Rogerson Institute at New York Presbyterian Hospital. Even in this frail state, evidenced by her use of a cane and assistance from Coger, her commitment to privacy never wavered. Greta Garbo passed away on April 15, 1990, at New York Presbyterian Hospital due to pneumonia and kidney failure, along with other health issues including periodontal and gastrointestinal diseases. Her family fought to keep the details of her death private, but information eventually became public. She had a small private funeral attended only by family members, and in accordance with her wishes, her remains were cremated. The location of her ashes was unknown for nine years, until they were finally placed in Skog Sky Crow Garden Cemetery near Stockholm, Sweden in 1999. Garbo never had children, but was close to her brother's family. Her niece, Gray Reisfeld, inherited her entire estate, valued at $32 million in 1990, which included investments in stocks and bonds, and an art collection housed in her spacious New York apartment. The Swedish Sphinx is one of the most unlikely stars of all time, in a world where so many have thrown themselves into the fire merely to get one shot at fame, Garbo worked all her life to defend herself from it. The Garbo eyes, the Garbo voice, the Garbo sexual and erotic power defined a whole aspect of Hollywood that has, in truth, been lost since she left the screen all those years ago. The strange irony of Hollywood is that, in the end, there is nothing more compelling than someone who is truly mysterious and unknowable, nothing more erotic and compelling than someone who does not let you see but lets you know there is more intensity there than one might dare imagine. She was a brilliant actress, who elevated often mediocre films to legendary status, thanks to her naturalism and emotional range. Film historian Ephraim Katz said, Of all the stars who have ever fired the imaginations of audiences, none has quite projected a magnetism and mystique equal to Garbo, the divine, the dream princess of eternity, the Sarah Bernhardt of films, are only a few of the superlatives writers used in describing her over the years. She played heroines that were at once sensual and pure, superficial and profound, suffering and hopeful, world-weary and life-inspiring. And none other than Betty Davis summarized her as her instinct, her mastery over the machine, was pure witchcraft. I cannot analyze this woman's acting. I only know that no one else so effectively worked in front of a camera. 
But Garbo herself put it all much more simply. Life would be so wonderful if we only knew what to do with it. If you've enjoyed this episode of Hollywood Mysteries, why not check out the benefits of becoming a YouTube member or joining our Patreon? Members get various benefits ranging from early access to our Hollywood History series, where we dig into the more granular details of fascinating elements from Hollywood's past in a weekly essay. Plus, there's discounted merch, like this rather fabulous exclusive anime Wong t-shirt and poster. Thank you to all those who have signed up already. That's all from Hollywood Mysteries. Sweet dreams.